on January 12, 2010. 230,000 people in Haiti lost their lives in about 90 seconds. A magnitude 7.0 earthquake rocked the capital of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, leaving a trail of death and desolation of phenomenal proportions. We will look at how Jamaica would have fared on January 12, 2010, had the epicenter of that deadly quake been in Jamaica and not Haiti. The epicenter of the Haiti quake was located along the Enriquillo Plantain Garden Fault System, which forms the southern boundary of the Gonave microplate. The Enriquillo Plantain Garden Fault stretches from Hispaniola to Jamaica. When I first heard about the earthquake in Haiti, my first reaction was one of profound shock. So much destruction, so much loss of life, and so close to us here in Jamaica. Consider the following. The quake happened in the same time zone, on a fault line that runs right up to our capital city. Its epicenter was within 300 miles of Kingston, and many of us actually felt the quake. The general insurance industry is directly impacted by the fallout of the occurrence of natural disasters. Insurance was created for the very purpose of indemnifying persons from losses resulting from natural disasters. For us at NEM, there was an extra significance. People turned to their insurance companies after a catastrophe to get back on their feet. We have to be sure that we can pay our claims, and to be able to pay those claims after a catastrophe, we must have adequate reinsurance. What many people don't realize about reinsurance is that it's finite and it's expensive. If you buy too little, you risk not being able to pay your claims. If you buy too much, you can make insurance unaffordable for your customers. So we had to know. Could our reinsurance program have coped if it had been Jamaica instead of Haiti? The best way for us to find out without actually living through a devastating earthquake was to commission a study. So we asked the guys at Mona Geoinformatics and the earthquake unit at UWE to build us a model that moved the earthquake along the fault line to the worst possible position for Jamaica and to tell us what would have happened if it had in fact been Jamaica instead of Haiti. The model was commissioned to exactly replicate the vital statistics of the Haiti earthquake, the focal depth and the magnitude of the earthquake. It was then just a matter of locating where to put this earthquake in Jamaica. The same plant and garden fault runs um, from Jamaica to Haiti. We sought to place the, the epicenter of this um, Haiti and Jamaica earthquake as close as you can to the capital, Kingston. That way you replicated the physical proximities of the Haiti earthquake to Port-au-Prince, the Haitian capital, and in this case, Kingston, our capital. However, just like cloning, 
Simply replicating the vital statistics of the earthquake does not necessarily mean that the effect and impact would be the same. Ground attenuation away from the epicenter are different in Jamaica as it is in Haiti, just because there's simply different geological environments in which the earthquake waves will be passing. However, once it reaches the Ligonier Plain behind me, it starts to get some serious damage, and that's what happened in 1907, that's what happened in 1692, that's what would happen if a Haiti in Jamaica would occur. Again, Port-au-Prince was not the epicenter of the Haitian earthquake, yet Port-au-Prince suffered the most damage. Again, in Haiti in Jamaica, Kingston would suffer the most damage. The highest frequency of earthquakes in Jamaica occur along the Banton Garden Fault Zone in the eastern part of Jamaica. We use this zone as a means to model the effects of a January 10 earthquake occurring in Jamaica. At least it's a similar focal mechanism as the Haiti event occurring along the zone in, in Jamaica. We looked at all the historic events dating back from 1688 to the current time. We try to understand the geotechnical properties of the rocks in the area, the geophysical properties, how waves travel through the ground. So we try to use these models to develop the effects of an earthquake of this nature, the January 10, 97 event in Haiti occurring along the Plant and Garden Fault. From this event, we were able to determine how the waves would travel across the different parts of Jamaica. An event occurring along the Trinityville and Tully area of St. Thomas would generate serious intensities across this region and move laterally across the island. As we move further from Kingston, you know, there's a diminishing in terms of the effects on the ground. When dealing with earthquakes, there are two terms that you need to be familiar with. Magnitude and intensity. Magnitude speaks to the strength of the earthquake. Intensity speaks to what is actually felt. You feel a loose shaking of the earth or you feel a severe shaking of the earth. One of the things that we need to understand is that the earthquake is more than just the magnitude and intensity of the event itself. We need to consider the building types that go into play and that are going to be affected by the earthquake ground motion. We need to understand the location in which the ground motion is moving through. All of these things play significant roles in determining the amount of damage that we can expect from an earthquake event. For example, the differences between Haiti and Jamaica also redound to the fact that our building practices are very different from theirs. Squatters in Haiti typically don't build with block and steel. Squatters in Jamaica do. Behind me, we have the communities of Kintyre, etc., which have significant uh, numbers of squatter communities, all with block and steel. However, behind me, we can actually see several buildings, but um, presumably block and steel, but perched very precariously over the edge of the riverbed. In the event of an earthquake, that building is going to fall into the river en masse. Block and steel and all. One of the things we also should understand is that because of the nature of ground motion, you're going to, obviously you're going to see crumbling and cracking structures where it depends on the structure. Fine built masonry structures such as what you see at the university and so on will withstand ground motion a lot better than more poorly built structures. Earthquakes happen suddenly and without warning. They have no season, no time of day, and no special conditions that could be easily detected beforehand. They just happen, and they happen quickly. There is no time to run or to escape. You are either in a secure location when the quake occurs and you are safe, or you are not, and your life is left to fate. The 2010 Haiti earthquake had many different implications on Jamaican society, not least of which the fact that it was so close to Jamaica it really um, hit home. One of the implications of the scientific research that followed that Haiti earthquake 
in addition to measuring the magnitude and intensity of the event itself and what would happen in Jamaica, is to relate what would happen to our built environment, our social environment, in addition to the natural environment. These are the important considerations that the Mona Energy Informatics Institute took into play when we engage in this study. You see, one of the things about scientific modeling comes the question at the end, so what? What do we do with this? This study really tries to take a look at that. How many buildings would be affected? Where would it be affected? And also the cost of the impact. And these are some of the realities that we try to incorporate into the model and the analysis thereafter. On January 12, 2010, lives were lost and forever changed in Haiti. Indeed, another major and sad chapter was added to the history of that nation. What would the results have been had it been January 12, 2010 in Jamaica? We've been talking about earthquakes and we associate earthquakes with falls. I mean, we know the earthquakes really are caused by very large falls. But here we have a very small fall that shows you typically how rocks become displaced from each other and generate the forces that cause the earth more or less to, to move. So this is more or less a trend of that fall. We can see evidence of displaced rock layers. So it's not a continuous layer. We know these are more or less the same units, but they are displaced. They are relatively moved or offset from each other. What we have here is a very small fault. It can be compared to the Haiti event of 2010. The only difference is just a matter of scale. In Haiti, you had large areas of landmasses and rocks being displaced relative to each other. The effects of major earthquakes can cause serious destruction. I mean, the event in Haiti was felt in Jamaica. I mean, the strong magnitude event can also happen along the Plant and Garden Fault. This fault has been responsible for unleashing death and desolation across Jamaica. The 1992 and the 1907 earthquakes are probably two of the most notable earthquakes in Jamaica's history. The epicenter has been associated with the northern boundary of the Wagwater Fault Zone. If we were to use this rock to represent Jamaica, you can see continuous patterns on this rock surface. We could use this to equate with the continuous fault lines that we see across Jamaica. Jamaica is filled with fault lines. We have a number of major fault lines. We talk about the plant and garden fault that starts from the eastern part of Jamaica, moves into the central part, into the Kingston St. Andrew area. We talk about the Wagwater Fault, the central part of Jamaica. We talk about the Crawl River, the New Mark in Montpelier Fault Zone, and the Duanville. These are the major fault zones within Jamaica. One of the things we need to remember is that faults are always around us. It doesn't necessarily need to be associated with an earthquake event. We're standing on the Ligonier Ridge right now, Jackson, and right below us is the Whitewater Fault, an active fault system. This would not have been associated with the Haiti earthquake, but it's still an active fault system. In the background we have um, Long Mountain, again a fault control hill, and all around us in front of us is um, the leg in the plane upon which Kingston was developed. The thing about faults and the thing about alluvial plains is that these are areas that would be particularly affected by earthquake ground waves moving from the hypothetical epicenter of the Antilly. And these are the areas that would particularly feel the damage of the Haiti and Jamaica event. The Haiti quake lasted about 40 seconds.
That's how long it took for this fall to initiate a chain of events that would kill 230,000 people. An event similar to the event in Haiti, a bit of magnitude 7, similar depth. We looked at the intensities across different parts of the island. From this event, we see strong intensities like the intensity 10 in Kingston and Port Antonio, Morant Bay. These are areas where we'd expect serious ground shaking, serious damages to buildings, major landslides. As we move away from Kingston, or much more distant from the event, we see a diminishing intensity. Spanish town, probably we might see an intensity of 8. Montego Bay, we probably have an intensity of 5. Based on the models, this is the kind of intensity we see across the island. Strong intensities around the epicenter, and as you move laterally from the epicenter, we have you know, minimal amount of shaking. With the best of plans, the actual experience is sometimes beyond the imagination. Jamaica provided help to Haiti within a day following the January 12, 2010 quake. The 12th of January 2010 changed the lives of a lot of people, including members of the JDF. Because within 48 hours of that earthquake in Haiti, uh, members of the JDF were required to go to Haiti to render assistance. Um, as a commander of that team that deployed to Haiti, um, the challenges were enormous. But through teamwork and a dedication and a, and, and a commitment to really render the assistance that was required, we were able to overcome these challenges and provide some relief to the people of Haiti who were really suffering uh, from the effects of this devastating uh, earthquake. I had been working with Haiti for some years now. I'd visited Haiti before, so um, apart from having a knowledge of Haiti, of the ground, and working with the people in Haiti, I also speak French. Um, so I was translating, but also leading the outreach programs um, that we started in the first couple of weeks with the, after we arrived. Initially, we arrived just a couple of days after the earthquake um, and, and saw the complete devastation in the town of Port-au-Prince. Uh, people were asking us for help continuously. Um, they had no shelter, no food, no water. Um, many of them had either had loved ones that had died during the earthquake or were still lost um, and so we were trying to assist in, in actually finding people underneath the rubble. The purpose of the deployment really was to assist, render assistance to the Haitian people and uh, also to provide support for the medical team from the Ministry of Health. Both the military team and the team from the Ministry of Health actually conducted treatment. We saw a lot of compound broken bones, compound fractures and lacerations, head injuries, chest injuries of children, young adults and of course the elderly. A part of our group was stationed at the airport, the other part moved inland. The men and women who took part in the relief effort saw firsthand the way a major quake can change the human and physical landscape of a nation. The thing that stood out most in my mind from Haiti was the magnitude of destruction, the, the, how the multi-story buildings literally pancaked like floor to floor on top of each other. Just regular buildings just literally falling over. Walls just lit, just fall over in one piece. Along with that 
were the destruction of the roads themselves. You'd actually see the roads split, like distinct openings in the middle of the roads in some areas. But the most devastating parts were the multi-story buildings that literally just each floor just fell on top of each other. And um, imagining that those buildings were occupied at the time, you can just imagine that they were uh, the persons who were trapped there can be deemed um, dead. My first view of Haiti was via aircraft. When I was getting to Haiti, I could see the mass destruction that was taking place. That has taken place, and um, I could also see a lot of buildings demolished, a lot of people walking. Most of the persons who came to us, they were crying for help. They were very desperate as it relates to trying to find their loved ones. And they didn't have anywhere to turn to find them. They were just hopeless and just walking around aimlessly. asking for help and they crying that was really really touching to know that um, you're there to help them but at the same time you can't help them to the point where you can recover their loved ones One night I was passing by the hospital to, to check on my guys and see how things were going. And I heard a young girl, 13 years old, screaming, absolutely terrified. Um, she had just been advised by a foreign doctor who was working at the, at the hospital that he was going to remove her leg. Um, I was able to speak with uh, Dr. Blake, one of our our leading orthopedic surgeons who was working at the hospital at that time and get him to come to her and uh, he looked on the leg and said no we can fix this and I promised the young lady I said listen I will stay with you until you're fixed I promise you I won't leave you and um, we took her into the theater and I assisted um, with the operation and kept her calm and then afterwards um, I went to visit her several times and every time the biggest, brightest smile that you can possibly imagine on her face um, and I understand that she's walking and, and leading a normal life now. The, the, the task to actually assist in the repatriation of two members of CARICOM that were a part of the Caribbean's, Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority that went for a conference and they unfortunately perished in the earthquake. Just having to go to the hotel, to the site, and see the devastation that was there. I mean, five weeks later, you could still smell the dead bodies that were trapped under there. Some of them have not or yet to be recovered. Um, just going through the personal effects and actually seeing the bodies, I actually had to be there at one of the autopsies and just to assist with the identification of the bodies, repatriation of, 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 of his personal effects and also trying to attend to basically his last 
affairs and lays with his family members. That really what, what struck me to the fact that you can go to a foreign country and you had to deal with one of your own. So I mean it makes you realize that much more that I mean that could have been you, that could have been me. I could have gone to a conference in Haiti and actually have been that person that perished in the earthquake. According to the Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters, 2010 was the deadliest year in at least two decades. A United Nations report stated around 207 million people in total around the world were affected by natural disasters, including floods, quakes, and landslides. Natural disasters have an economic cost to the countries that endure them. At a time of fragile global economic conditions, what might be the cost of a magnitude 7.0 earthquake to Jamaica? Entirely, we're just coming out of a recession period, so a lot of resources don't abound. And on top of that, I think the, the activities of the donors have been quite intense over the last year or two. Um, not just coming out of, of the Haiti earthquake, but there were a number of floods which would have drawn on their own resources. Uh, then we had about three to four major seismic events in, in 2010 that would have also pulled on the resources, Haiti being a major draw on global funding. And coming into 2011, we had two of our major donors to, to global aid, um, Japan and New Zealand, who, who were affected by, by significant earthquakes, tsunamis, and so forth. So I think that is going to really make it difficult as we go forward in the future for there to be this massive outpouring of aid. We do understand that they, they, they do, once it's a global event, that they, they are, are, are partners in the US or in Japan, wherever, will try to lend some assistance. But I think it's not going to be um, as significant as it could have been had there not been this series of events over the last two years. This is why, as an organization, we promote risk reduction. It's important that we begin to look at taking necessary steps to minimize the risk of, of, of losses, major losses, certainly to our economic and productive sectors. Portmore did not experience any significant damage from the 1907 earthquake event that devastated Kingston because Portmore was not developed at that time. Since then, however, Portmore has grown into a sizable community, larger than the population of Barbados, and this area is at particular risk, potentially. While well designed and properly developed and laid out, we've had several instances of Portmore buildings being extended upwards and outwards with or without um, the parish council or local government approval. And these create different design conditions in which the building is operating. We're talking about increased load, we're talking about a different footprint that would be affected as a result of ground shaking. Lino Park um, is by and large suitable for most military short takeoff and landing aircraft. This includes the C-130 Hercules transport aircraft which are the primary sort of airlift platform used in delivering relief supplies to disaster stricken areas. Um, the issue is not so much to do with the, the, the length of the airfield but really the surrounding facilities and, and infrastructure that will support um, receiving storing and then distributing the supplies that come in. Um, there is a reasonable amount of real estate in our park camp to facilitate that, but certainly a core disaster from this 
scale and magnitude of what's occurred in Haiti and the amount of relief supplies that came in. Um, this would just be a preliminary point until other areas such as the Normal International Airport and others perhaps in Montego Bay and a few other aerodromes that we have around the island could be used as, as other staging areas. But certainly uh, I think our facilities in our camp would be sufficient to start the relief process. Comparing Jamaica's terrain with Haiti, it is pretty much the same. And the impact of the earthquake in Haiti in terms of the overall environment would have had the same in Jamaica. The difference, however, I think would be the method of construction of buildings. We do things drastically different in Jamaica based on what we saw in Haiti and how we do construction in Jamaica. As you can see in front of us, um, this is a building um, coming out of its foundation and you can see the amount of reinforcement bars that are being used. As a result of this, if an earthquake should hit, this building will stand a great chance of surviving that earthquake because of the reinforcement that you see running throughout the structure itself. Concrete is high in compressive strength and as a result of that, it is easy to crush or to crumble on itself. As a result of that, reinforcement bars are used to complement that because it's high in intensive strength. And what this does, it offers resistance to any kind of compression that the concrete itself will force down on the building. So as a result of that resistance provided by the reinforcement bar, this building will be able to withstand an earthquake much better than what we saw in Haiti. So what were our conclusions from all of this? Well, one of the key things that we wanted to know was how many of our insured buildings would have been damaged and how would that damage have translated into dollars of claims. The model told us that our reinsurance was more than adequate. Because of better building practices, 
infrastructure and disaster preparedness, Jamaica may well have fared much better than Haiti, but it still would have been a very significant, frightening and destructive event. We all have to recognize the serious threat that earthquakes pose to Jamaica and prepare as best we can.